Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. Andrew is off. Hundreds of thousands of tax dollars to create more privacy at Rideau Hall, and the Governor General still hasn't moved in. I think uh, it's problematic, it's regrettable. New details of the cost being incurred to meet Julie Payette's demands. The U.S. President reimposes tariffs on Canadian aluminum. Canada was taking advantage of us. Why now? What's the impact here? An apology from the Toronto police over their handling of the DeFonte Miller case, but not everyone is buying it. They must think we're stupid. It's a big decision for any presidential candidate, so who will Joe Biden pick? Our expert panel is here with their insights. This is The National. We have exclusive new details on Canada's embattled Governor General. CBC News has learned that Julie Payette's concern with privacy has cost taxpayers hundreds of thousands of dollars. While looking into allegations of abusive behaviour by Payette and her senior staff, CBC News uncovered some strange and excessive spending, all to modify and renovate the Governor General's official residence, where three years into her mandate, she's yet to actually reside. Ashley Burke broke the story for CBC News. She has it for us tonight. It's a national historic site, the official home and workplace to all governors general dating back to 1867. It's also largely open to the public to wander the grounds or tour inside. Sources say that lack of privacy is the reason Governor General Julie Payette has resisted living there. Despite millions of dollars in updates to Rideau Hall, CBC News has learned the Governor General's office requested even more expensive changes before Payette will move in. Sources say the renovation plan started with an idea to have a door on the second floor so Payette's cats can go outside. Then the idea grew, turning into a project to build a full private staircase for Payette to enter and exit the building without anyone seeing. Almost $140,000 was already spent on design plans and studies before Rideau Hall eventually scrapped the project. Another $117,000 spent installing new access gates around Payette's office. Sources say the RCMP didn't require them for security. Rather, Payette doesn't like to see maintenance workers or other staff in her line of sight. It's a great deal of money to make a permanent change. This expert on Canadian Governors General criticizes the spending. The idea of the of this sort of spending for the comfort of one incumbent is, is problematic in that sense and, and I think regrettable. Others say taking the role as the Queen's representative involves losing some personal privacy. When you come into a role like this that it's a very public role. These are discussions that probably should have been had uh, before uh, coming in into that role. Despite all the costs, three years into her five-year mandate, Payette is still living in a guest house nearby, normally used by foreign dignitaries. The Governor General's office said there are still outstanding issues with the official residence's privacy, accessibility and security, especially in light of an armed man driving onto the grounds last month. So, unlike past Governors General, Payette is living elsewhere for the foreseeable future. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. That is not the only political headache for the government tonight. U.S. President Trump has suddenly slapped a new 10% tariff on Canadian aluminum unconcerned about condemnation from both sides of the border. Peter Armstrong looks at what Canada is in for this time. It hasn't exactly been a great summer for any industry. Now this. Earlier today I signed a proclamation that defends American industry by reimposing aluminum tariffs on Canada. Just weeks after the new NAFTA deal came into effect, U.S. President Donald Trump is throwing a stick in the spokes of Canada-U.S. trade. Canada was taking advantage of us. A tariff, though, is just a fancy word for a tax, a tax on Americans buying products made with Canadian aluminum. It doesn't mean we're not going to shut down smelters because of this. We're not going to <clears throat> lay people off or anything. So the real hit won't be on Canadians at all. He's making everything from F-150s to fighter jets to a can of beer more expensive. But Trump clearly feels the need to change the channel. COVID cases in the U.S. remain unsettlingly high. His support is plummeting, an election just 89 days away. So should Canada strike back or wait and see what November brings? We can probably swallow a 10% tariff. We are the, there's a reason why we're the major supplier to the United States. They need that product. 
And so ultimately, it's just American consumers that will pay. That's the kind of smart response. So the question is less what this may mean for the Canadian industry and more how will a liberal minority in Ottawa respond to this latest provocation? Peter Armstrong, CBC News, Toronto. Now, Peter touched on something there. This does feel political as much as it does economic. So let's bring in Rob Russo, Parliamentary Bureau Chief for CBC News. Rob, it does feel significant that Trump made this announcement in the Rust Belt. So why Ohio? Why now? Well, who would have thought that the road to the presidency might rumble through uh, places like Kitimat and Jonquière, Quebec, where the aluminum smelters are? But that's true. Ohio is a swing state, and it is the most important swing state. Uh, no Republican president has won the presidency without winning in Ohio. And right now, a couple of numbers. Trump is behind in the polls there by a point or two. And there are 89 days to go until that election in the United States. All right, so that might work for the president, but what options does the Canadian government have in response to this, and, and really should it be using those options? Uh, Deputy Prime Minister Christopher Freeland said tonight that, uh, that they're going to match these tariffs dollar for dollar, but they can't be as strategic as they were in trade wars past, where they went after swing states, Kentucky, for instance, with bourbon, uh, Florida with oranges, uh, because uh, they, they're limited to sectoral response, in other words, aluminum tariffs. So they might just be forced to wait until the Trump tornado blows through if he's defeated by Joe Biden in November. All right, Rob Russo, Parliamentary Bureau Chief. Thanks, Rob. My pleasure, Adrian. Christian Freeland is expected to speak more about this at a news conference tomorrow morning. Justin Trudeau, meanwhile, echoed his deputy's tough talk in a tweet late tonight, mentioning that dollar-for-dollar dollar retaliation, then saying we will always stand up for our aluminum workers. We did so in 2018. We will stand up for them again now. Allegations in a new lawsuit read like the plot of a spy novel. A former top Saudi intelligence officer now living in Canada is accusing Prince Mohammed bin Salman of putting a hit out on him. Evan Dyer lays it all out. The events alleged in today's lawsuit came at a time when Canada's relationship with Saudi Arabia was worse than it had ever been. A tweet by Canada's foreign minister in support of a detained women's rights activist had enraged Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, who retaliated by ordering Saudi students to leave Canada, stopping flights and purchases of Canadian grain. In October 2018, a hit squad sent from Saudi Arabia lured Washington-based dissident Jamal Khashoggi to the Saudi consulate in Istanbul, where they murdered him and dismembered his body with a saw. The lawsuit filed in Washington today says that a second Saudi hit squad traveled by air to Toronto just days before the Khashoggi murder became public and attempted to enter this country on tourist visas. But Canada border service agents were suspicious and refused them entry. The lawsuit says their target was this man, Major General Saad al-Jabri, a former Saudi intelligence chief and cabinet minister who lives in exile in Toronto. That seems to have been their playbook that they were using at that time. Dennis Horak was Canada's last ambassador to Saudi Arabia. He says Al-Jabri was a senior confidant of top Saudi royals. So he may know some, some secrets and some details and, you know, quote unquote, where the bodies are buried, literally and perhaps figuratively as well. The government says it will investigate. We will not tolerate any uh, foreign interference by state and non-state actor in Canada. Uh, Canada is a liberal democracy. We will take all measures with our security services, our intelligence services to prevent, disrupt, and protect Canadians and whoever is on Canadian soil. Al Jabri is a former general in Saudi Arabia's repressive security structure, so hardly a paragon of human rights himself. What makes him a target, the lawsuit alleges, is his closeness to former Crown Prince Mohammed bin Nayef, now deposed and jailed by his young nephew Mohammed bin Salman. And what makes him a danger to Mohammed bin Salman, he says, is that he knows too much about him. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Ottawa. In Beirut today, there are scenes of grief and anger after Tuesday's explosion. People are gathering for funerals for some of the more than 130 people killed in the blast at the city's port. They're gathering, too, to push for political change, protesting against a government they say does not protect them. Today, the calls for change came from someone else, too, France's president. Here's René Filippone. There is little that stood between George Ferron's parents' home and the thousands of tons of explosive chemicals that triggered destruction across Beirut. Oh, you can see all the damages. I, I'm, I'm happy that my parents were in the rooms inside. They are safe, uh, thanks God, but uh, much wounded. 
He says he doesn't understand how this could happen. This is too much. Yani, uh, who's responsible? I don't know. While people look for answers, the search continues for those still missing. And a cleanup is just beginning. In this deeply wounded city, enter French President Emmanuel Macron, the first world leader to visit, touring what's left of the port and drawing a crowd of locals nearby, where desperate calls for help came from people who have lost faith in their own government, which they say is corrupt. Do a proper investigation. Hold those accountable for this entire mess and crisis. Your anger is yes. my source of optimism. Macron was clear there is long-term assistance available, but political reform in the country must happen. Elle implique une responsabilité historique. It implies a historic responsibility for the current leaders, he says. This crisis is political, moral, economic and financial, and the primary victim is the Lebanese people. Among those victims, Georges Debise was carried to his funeral today and mourned by a family in shock. He's a martyr of Lebanon, his sister repeats over and over. Debiz was in hospital, donating blood moments before he was killed by the blast. The explosion came at a time when Lebanon was already on the brink of collapse. Public anger amid allegations of corruption and mismanagement saw a crowd turn on a Lebanese politician. A sense of hopelessness is setting in for Amina, who takes stock of what she has left. We didn't have windows, we didn't have doors, all the plates, the, everything is broken. She says it's not just her home that's unlivable anymore. She is giving up on Lebanon. We hope to go to another country that they respect, respect the human. Because here they didn't disrespect. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. The scale of the destruction, just how widespread it is, is still hard to imagine. The governor of Beirut estimates at least 300,000 people were displaced by the explosion. Their homes wrecked, their belongings strewn, and their windows are simply gone. But as Rebecca Collard shows us, people are stepping up to help. There's thousands of volunteers from across the country that have descended on uh, the central Beirut. In this neighborhood of Marmi Kyle, there's people everywhere trying to just help sweep up, clean up debris, and assist the people in this neighborhood that were so badly affected. Actually, the whole group here, we're not from Beirut uh, exactly. We are like from different parts of Lebanon. From what I've seen today and yesterday too, the strength and the unity of the Lebanese people will actually get us through this. So this woman lives in this neighborhood and she's just taking us up these three flights of stairs to the apartment she's lived in for 30 years that essentially has been completely destroyed. Do you have the food and the supplies that you need? I don't have anything here. Show, show me what show you have. Come in, please. Where do we want to put the food? We don't have generator, we don't have electricity. Nobody, nobody can help us. The volunteers helped you? Yeah. That's yeah. very kind. Yeah. Yeah, very, very human, not uh, only kind, human. My, my luggage is uh, almost ready. So I'm actually inside the home of a Lebanese Canadian. She was actually planning to return to Canada uh, just a week from now, and she'd been getting her coronavirus test, hoping that she would be able to uh, to go back. So this is the inside of one resident's home in this neighborhood, but there are hundreds of homes in this neighborhood that have been affected by uh, this explosion, and the volunteers here are doing the best they can to help people um, clean up, but there is just so much work to be done. Rebecca Collard, CBC News, Beirut. And we have one more story out of Beirut to tell you tonight, and it belongs to this little guy. This is George, the incredible story of his entry into this world a little later. And there's big political news out of Nova Scotia today. Premier Stephen McNeil is stepping down after 17 years in politics. I'm very proud of my record. I'm proud of the things that we were able to do as a team. Uh, but now it's time for someone else to, uh, to lead the province. McNeil says he's been thinking about this for a long time, but delayed the decision when the pandemic hit. He will stay on until the province's Liberal Party chooses a new leader. And late tonight, President Donald Trump signed an executive order prohibiting U.S. residents 
from doing business with the video sharing app TikTok and its parent company. TikTok has been accused of sharing data with the Chinese government. TikTok denies that. The order takes effect in 45 days. Microsoft is reportedly in talks to buy the app. The Toronto Police Service has apologized for a vicious attack committed by one of its own off-duty officers. The assault left a young black man blind in one eye, but it wasn't initially reported to Ontario's police watchdog, the SIU. Katie Nicholson has been following the story and brings us up to speed tonight. Defonte Miller's swollen and disfigured face told the story of a brutal beating at the hands of an off-duty Toronto police officer and his brother. The then 19-year-old even lost an eye. For the last three and a half years, questions have lingered. Why wasn't the off-duty officer, Michael Terrio, immediately reported to Ontario's Special Investigations Unit? The body which reviews police conduct. We made the wrong decision that night. Today, an admission from the interim Toronto Police Chief. It decided not to report the officer because he was off-duty at the time. As a result of that decision, trust has been broken between the police, Defonte Miller, and the broader community. For that, on behalf of the Toronto Police Service, I want to apologize. Today's apology prompted by a confidential report from another provincial body that investigates police complaints. We understand clearly now the legislation does not distinguish between on-duty and off-duty conduct, and neither will we. So just saying, oh, we were wrong about that, years later is not accountability. Black activist Desmond Cole says even now Toronto police aren't being honest. It's asking us to believe that only now do the police realize that when one of their officers beats someone and causes a lifelong injury that maybe they should call the SIU, that they didn't know that three and a half years ago, that they didn't know that any time between then and now, but today they have realized that. They must think we're stupid. And there is criticism, too, about the secrecy around the report. Only police and the victim have copies. This was uh, a report written by a public institution about another public institution uh, on a matter of public interest. And from my perspective, that report itself should be made public. That may happen as soon as tomorrow, when Defonte Miller and his lawyer are expected to speak. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. New data published today details an alarming picture of the number of Canadians who hurt or kill themselves. Nearly 4,000 people died by suicide and thousands were hospitalized because of self-harm last year. Susanna De Silva has the details. Ready to do this? I've been waiting. It was a journey they began together, but she is finishing apart. Being a widow of someone who took their own life is not something I wish on anyone. Raising a son by myself who doesn't have a father, I want people to take their mental health seriously. <laughs> Mayor McHale's husband Jeremy struggled with depression and anxiety before taking his own life. They were able to seek help from a counselor, but getting expert help isn't the case for everybody. If you don't have a doctor and you don't have access to therapy, unfortunately, that first line of defense is the emergency room. And new statistics show that is where thousands of Canadians end up looking for help. According to the Canadian Institute for Health Information, 21,000 Canadians were admitted to hospital for self-harm between April of 2018 and March of 2019. 3,800 died by suicide in 2019, and the data found that young women and girls aged 10 to 24 were three times higher than young men and boys in the same age group to be hospitalized for self-harm. It's graduating school, going into careers, figuring out your life. It's definitely a really vulnerable age range. Sadia Fazilyar reached out for help after facing her own struggles with mental health and now helps students at Ryerson University. She says getting help, especially for marginalized groups, can be challenging. And that was before the pandemic. The Canadian Mental Health Association found more Canadians are having suicidal thoughts since COVID began. I think all of the warning signs are there that there are fairly dire outcomes and we are actually are living dire outcomes right now. It's still incredibly difficult and lonely and isolating. McHale says it is worrying to see the increase in people messaging her for help, but that it also means people are more willing to talk about it and look for new resources online. Susanna the Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. 
So if you or someone you know needs support, you can call or text Crisis Services Canada and Kids Help Phone at that number on your screen or visit them online. People are available around the clock. Across the country, parents and teachers are telling us they're worried about back to school. This reopening plan is like a child who left his term paper to the last minute and is surprised they get an F. Up next, they say governments will have to shell out for safety. I haven't had a generator yet, and I'm thinking that's on the, the shopping list. Preparing for a record hurricane season during a pandemic. And in labor during the explosion. I thought we were going to die. The story of baby George, born in Beirut as the city exploded. We're back in two. Welcome back. It may feel hard to believe, but next week marks five months since COVID-19 turned Canada on its head. Across the country tonight, infection numbers are mostly down or at least flat. BC today, same as yesterday, with 47 new cases. Alberta reported 56, about half of yesterday's total. Quebec saw 133, also down. Ontario was up slightly to 95, but Manitoba saw its second highest one-day spike since March with 30 new cases. Still, officials call it manageable. We don't want to have to impose um, significant restrictions uh, because we think that if we stick with those fundamentals, we can live with this virus rather than shut things down. 18 of those 30 new cases are connected to an existing cluster in Brandon. That started with someone who traveled east of Manitoba and did not properly self-isolate. There are 118 active cases in the province. So when you consider the impact of a moment of complacency or a mistake, then is it any wonder parents and teachers are so worried about the looming school year? As Deanna Sumanek johnson tells us, some fear the pandemic safety plans aren't safe enough. Sick Kids is talking about supporting parents. This retired teacher is not used to her work being widely shared on the internet. The ministry guideline doesn't address that. But all. that's exactly what happened. Uh, Wendy Goods looked at Ontario's school reopening plan and lined it up against Sick Kids Hospital's recommendations, creating a chart. They tended to choose the options that don't cost a lot of money. The more expensive recommendations, she says, were ignored, like good ventilation. Many, many classrooms have no windows that open. Some classrooms have no windows at all. A petition in Ontario signed by more than 150,000 parents calls for a reduction in class sizes, something Ontario's government has planned for high schools, but not elementary schools. I want to get as small classrooms as, as possible. Uh, with it within certain parameters. Let's make no mistake about this. We have the best plan, bar none, over any province. One thing is for sure, other provincial plans are also getting criticized by parents. This reopening plan is like a child who left his term paper to the last minute and is surprised they get an F. David Gray has concerns even after the addition of a new measure just two days ago, requiring students grade four and up to wear masks. At the end of the day, we need to figure out a way so that we can cut the number of kids in a school at any one time by about half. In British Columbia, which will have mandatory in-class instruction but not mandatory masks, parents and teachers have been pushing to delay the reopening of schools. And if it takes a few more days, so be it. But today, we're focused on starting the school year as we had planned. Wendy Goods and David Gray say they're confident their activism will be heard too by governments that really can't afford to get this wrong. Deanna Sumanak johnson CBC News, Toronto. Next on The National, awaiting Joe Biden's vice presidential pick. Why his choice could change the game, our U.S. political panel is next. Plus, getting ready for a monster hurricane season, why this year especially it pays to be prepared. But first... He was born for the stage, brilliant, versatile, and quintessentially Canadian. Actor Brent Carver has died at the age of 68. Carver played theatres across the country and abroad, but he had a special bond with the Stratford Festival, shining in everything from Hamlet to Jesus Christ Superstar. 
Today, Stratford's artistic director said Carver had, quote, infinite variety. He was fire and air. Carver won a Tony Award for Kiss of the Spider Woman on Broadway, but he always came home, and home is where he died. Cranbrook, B.C., his favorite place on earth, according to his family. They did not give a cause of death. Former Vice President Joe Biden now needs his own vice presidential candidate. That decision could come any day now, so be prepared for serious speculation and road testing of reputations. We know it will be a woman. There are strong suggestions it will be a woman of color. Biden is clear. He wants someone focused on the job, not an eventual presidential run. But if he's elected president at 78 years old, choosing someone capable of stepping up is just practical. So who's on the short list? The last week has seen a lot of attention on Karen Bass, a congresswoman from California. I do believe that President Biden will be a healer in chief, and we certainly need that now. With experience as a community organizer and a physician's assistant, she has quiet, progressive credentials and connections. She does not have the profile of a contender like Kamala Harris. I introduce the next president of the United States, Joe Biden. The senator has known Biden for a long time, but went hard at him during the presidential debates. Do you agree today that you were wrong to oppose busing in America then? No. Do you agree? I did not oppose busing in America. That moment resulted in lobbying by some in Democratic quarters to avoid Harris as VP choice. If she gets passed over, that moment may explain it. Advice. And then there's Susan Rice. You know, Are we going to see your name on a ticket? No. No, nah, I can't imagine that. But yes. Also not enough. Obama's former national security advisor clearly had her political future on her mind when we spoke last year. She had an office in the White House close to Biden's, was U.S. ambassador to the U.N., was a Rhodes Scholar. She has the experience and familiarity he'd want, but political observers suggest she might be a magnet for controversy, that Republicans would seize on the attacks at the embassy in Benghazi, Libya, and the way she handled the aftermath. Benghazi baggage, as it were, may be too heavy to carry. I will not be lectured about what our military needs by a five deferment draft dodger. Keep your eyes on Senator Tammy Duckworth. She's an Iraq War veteran, Purple Heart recipient, and is a formidable politician who's earned respect from both sides of the aisle. There might be two concerns. She was born in Bangkok, which could rule her out for an eventual presidential run. And she comes from a solidly democratic state. Biden may want someone who can help him in places where he needs it most, places like Florida. Sometimes the situation chooses you. And so take note of Congresswoman Val Demings. She caught national attention as a Democratic impeachment manager. She was also Orlando's first female police chief who spent 30 years on the force. She has pushed hard on bridging the racial divide in policing. Many argue she didn't push hard enough. Her record could help or hurt. Fundamentally, though, Biden wants a running mate who can energize voters and bring them together. Now, no matter which woman he chooses, it could very well be someone not on that list. The sleeves are being rolled up in preparation for some vicious attacks, something every candidate on that list has certainly seen before. With me tonight to talk about that VP choice and this election and what it means for our neighbors and this country is Aaron Haynes, editor at large of the 19th, a news organization focusing on politics, policy, and gender, and David Frum, senior editor at The Atlantic. Thank you both for joining us. So much to talk about here. So, Aaron, we have to start with you. You know, you know what do you make of Joe Biden announcing really early on that he was going to pick a woman as his vice president. What went through you when you heard that? Well, you know, I think it was a nod to the acknowledgement of a couple of things. Joe Biden was the, uh, you know, front runner for much of the 2020 uh, Democratic primary. And so that, in most voters' minds, already set the stage for a contest between two white men in their 70s in a country where the majority of the electorate is women. And so him signaling that he was going to have a woman 
uh, running mate on the ticket was really a sign not only of who the majority of the electorate in this country is, but really uh, what he sees as the future of the Democratic Party. Okay, so David, you know, we know presidents aren't usually chosen on the basis of, of their VP choice, but clearly, the, you know, the stakes are very different this time. Um, the stakes are very different for, from the point of view of governing. I think it probably is more true than ever that uh, the, the vice president will add little or nothing to the ticket. Um, this is an, a referendum on mismanagement of epidemic, mismanagement of the economy. This is an election that is all about Donald Trump. He will, it will, he will either survive or more probably lose. What Joe Biden, if he were taking advice from me, and why would he? But my advice to him would be, remember, you're not going to live forever. Um, not this is not just about 2024. You have to consider he's the oldest person ever to become president, and there is a pandemic. So the top consideration there are really two considerations. The top one is to pick someone who could, on day one, if need be, handle a national or international crisis. And the second consideration is somebody who's played politics at the highest level before, because this is a really hard game. This is this is no place to start your political career. Okay, it sounds like you have a hunch uh, who he might pick. I have no idea who he'll pick, but I, I would say um, it, it should be it should be somebody uh, uh, of the people you've mentioned that Kamala Harris and Susan Rice are in a different league from the people who've served in the House, uh, because um, Com Susan Rice has been a crisis manager. Uh, Kamala Harris has been a U.S. senator. She's running a statewide race, so they bring. Um, supreme qualifications to be ready to play an extremely difficult game. I, I don't think I don't think there's anything that can get you ready for how hard it is if you haven't done it before. Aaron, do you have an instinct on either who he should or who you'd like to see him pick? Oh no, I'm absolutely out of the prediction business in huh. American politics for sure. But you know what I say is, you know, obviously Joe Biden's going to pick the woman, which uh, you know for the third time in our history uh, is happening. And so it really is a question of whether the third time is going to be a charm or whether it's three strikes and out for both Joe Biden and the woman uh, who he will be naming as, as his running mate, possibly as soon as next week. So after he announces, Aaron, how many seconds do you give it before the misogynistic attacks begin? Oh, I'm sorry. The misogynistic attacks have already begun. <laughs> I mean, we've seen them. We saw them in the 2020 primary when a historic six women stood for president, that there were questions around electability, likability, and even though the voters don't get to choose who the vice president, uh, presidential running mate is, ultimately that choice is up to Joe Biden, we're already seeing uh, some of those same tropes being thrown around as Joe Biden gets closer to making that decision. Questions about ambition, as if that is not what politics is all about, right? Questions of likability. Does, you know, Kamala Harris rub people the wrong way, as, as the question was raised? or? Or even, um, you know, uh, questions about uh, questions that really focus more on personality traits than, than the qualifications of these talented and capable and qualified women. Okay, so because of this um, pandemic, I mean, clearly we're not going to get the kickstart of, of the traditional big splashy conventions and the balloons falling from the sky, any of that momentum. What do Americans, we'll start with you, David, what do Americans lose without a convention, but also what is gained? Um, Look, the, the real value of a convention is, is first, it, it showcases a candidate in a, an environment under the candidate's control. It allows the candidate to uh, make a more formal self-introduction to the American people. And second, it does a lot of party business. It's a way for a political party to think, who are we? And to re, re, reconnect personally. People sit down, they have dinner, they meet, they talk. Um, and then the party has sort of informal discussions about the direction of, in which it's going to go. So that discussion and that showcasing can't happen. But it, uh, I think Biden is better off because of it, because uh, the absence of the convention makes this election even more than a usual uh, election, an a referendum on the incumbent. This election is all about how do you feel about the condition of the country? And the more Biden can keep it focused on that question, Tom and Trump will insist on keeping it focused on that question, the worse for Donald Trump, because the condition of the country is so very, very bad. Aaron, do you have an instinct about the impact of, of not having these conventions? Well, I mean, the convention is usually a, an opportunity to have the candidates on a big stage. It is basically the starting gun, you know, for the home stretch into the general election and really a chance for the parties uh, really to kind of unite around that ticket and, and begin to get excited because it's starting to feel more real. But the fact that these conventions aren't happening is yet another reminder 
of, of, of the situation that, that we are in. These conventions are another, uh, yeah, they're a campaign casualty of the pandemic. And, and, and it will be a reminder for folks that, that this is already the most extraordinary election year that we've ever been in. Last question to you, David. You're in Canada right now. Uh, what do you think a Joe Biden presidency might mean for this country? Well, I think many Canadians will breathe a sigh of relief that it means uh, something more like normal. But a thing to worry about is that Biden really has embraced parts of the Trump trade agenda, that he's talked about um, raising national borders against medical trade. Um, the world needs more trade, not less. Uh, this pandemic has raised barriers between countries. And I worry that many of the voices around Joe Biden will encourage him to continue the protectionist direction started under, Don under Donald Trump. And that would be a, a bad thing for the United States, for Canada, for the world. Uh, on the other hand, there are going to be, from a Canadian point of view, a lot of familiar faces around Biden. And the, the language will be similar. And, and I think the whole world is going to give um, this administration, if it happens, a kind of honeymoon just to say, um, uh, thank you to have that all be over. And I think the uh, next Next American president will say, we vow to the world, we, we as a nation will never, ever, ever mix tequila and quaaludes ever again. <laughs> All right, I have to end there. All right, David from Aaron Haynes, thank you both very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Still ahead on the national, he came into the world during the Beirut explosion. Baby George and his grateful dad in our moment. Cleanup efforts continue in the United States after tropical storm Isaias tore across the Atlantic coast. It killed at least nine people and hundreds of thousands of homes still don't have power. This year's Atlantic hurricane season has already been a record breaker with nine major tropical storms, two of them reaching hurricane strength. And as Kayla Hounsell reports, forecasters say it is going to get worse. Jamie Davison knows firsthand the damage hurricanes can cause. Hurricane Juan brought down trees that did tens of thousands of dollars in damage to his home in 2003. We had two big tree strikes on the house, one in, the, in our, my youngest boy's bedroom, and, uh, and then one bounced off the house and took out my front porch and my car. His neighborhood was hit by Hurricane Dorian last year, too. And today, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in the United States announced this season could be extremely active, second only to 2005, the year of Hurricane Katrina. There could be up to 25 named storms, including up to 11 hurricanes. A normal year has 12 named storms. Um, so we are, you know, our forecast range has a range that is, could be as high as double the amount of activity for a normal, for a normal year. Part of the reason is warmer water. Scientists don't yet know whether it's linked to climate change. It's also unclear what all of this could mean for Canada. Until they form, it's impossible to say where they're going to go. This warning preparedness meteorologist with the Canadian Hurricane Centre says typically about 40% of the storms that develop in the Atlantic Ocean in a season impact Canada in some way. He is confident about one thing. People living along coastal areas of the Atlantic Ocean are going to be really lucky if we, you know, escape, you know, damage and destruction this year based on those numbers. He's urging Canadians to be prepared this year more than ever, as the pandemic will make it difficult, if not impossible, to prepare at the last minute. Jamie Davison intends to take that advice. I haven't had a generator yet, and I'm thinking that's on the, the shopping list. He's hoping for the best, but preparing for what could be one of the worst hurricane seasons on record. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. Okay, so good time then to check in with meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff. Johanna, what more can you tell us about the link of this to climate change? Uh, we know that the two main factors in hurricane development is warmer waters and wind shear, which is the upper level wind's ability to tear a storm apart. And as we heard from Kayla, we know sea surface temperatures are getting warmer and that is a, a link to climate change. In fact, you can see from this map, uh, the Atlantic is well above seasonal for anomalous temperatures right now. The other factor though, wind shear, that is also increasing uh, with climate change. So they are sort of canceling each other out. Uh, wind shear is very low this year and that's another reason why the hurricane prediction is so high, Adrian. So is this what we ex expect to see in the hurricane seasons ahead? 
Not necessarily. Uh, we know that because we've got these two opposing factors that climate change is increasing, the sea surface temperatures and wind shear, it doesn't necessarily mean we're going to see more storms. But what we are seeing is an increase in intensity, and that is showing up already in a detectable way. So in the future, we may not see more storms, but we might see more Category 3, Category 4, and Cat 5 storms, Adrian. Oh, great. Uh, Joanna, thanks very much. When we come back, marking 75 years since the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. Stay with us. Those are the bells on the Peace Tower in Ottawa ringing out 75 times, marking 75 years since the United States dropped the first atomic bomb over Hiroshima, Japan. Each year, there are fewer and fewer survivors to talk about their horrific experience. But Stephen D'Souza found a new generation is working hard to keep the memories alive. An explosion equal to 20,000 tons of TNT. Emiko Okada was just eight years old when the bomb hit. She was having breakfast with her family less than three kilometers away. Her sister, seen on the right, had just left. She would never return. There was a young girl who grabbed my pant leg and said, please help me. The next instant, she was gone in the flames. Hiroshima was a scene of unprecedented chaos. Tens of thousands were killed instantly. Three days later, the U.S. dropped another bomb on Nagasaki. Every year when the anniversary approaches, I think of those who are asking for help. I left them behind in order to run and save myself. Survivors like Okada-san are known as Hibaksha. For many, their goal is to advocate for a world free of nuclear weapons. Hibaksha helped push the UN to adopt a treaty banning nuclear weapons, but the nuclear powers and most NATO members, including Canada, haven't signed on. At this year's anniversary ceremony, the passage of time and the coronavirus means there are fewer and fewer Hibaksha to fight for change. <laughs> So a new generation is stepping up to take their place. Haruki Yamaguchi is a tour guide in Hiroshima. Her grandfather was Hibaksha. She says even in Japan, there are those who don't know the history of the bomb. Children would play among the buildings, on the roofs. and in She's helped launch a new app, which lets anyone visit the site virtually. If we stop talking about this, so it will be nobody talks in the future. Okada-san welcomes their efforts especially in a world where the superpowers are talking about more nuclear weapons, not less. I plead with all adults that this never happens again. We need to do something. A prayer that future generations never have to witness the horror of a nuclear attack. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, New York. Next on The National, as Beirut went up in a horrifying instant, one family was experiencing a different kind of life-changing moment. It's awesome. Baby George's story, next. There are so many pictures right now that tell the story of Beirut. They show destruction, both vast and personal. It's heart-wrenching grief and the kind of resilience you have to dig down deep to find. And then there's this picture of a newborn named George. This one tells a story all its own. The explosion happened just as George's mother was surrounded by nurses preparing to give birth. The chaos that followed and the joy that came out of it is our moment tonight. This was always going to be a life-changing moment. Last minute preps to bring a baby into the world. Dad behind the camera capturing it all. And then the blast happened. We just heard the sound, and everything was shattering around the glass, the instruments, the everything. Everything went through my mind. I thought everybody was dead. I thought we were going to die. All the ceiling was down. I was afraid that she might be hit or the baby was hit. She was all covered with glass. I tried getting my wife out first. I moved the bed outside. And then I started helping the nurses and doctors to get them, uh, get them up. And in that chaos, baby George was born. 
with flashlights for the medical staff and no medication for mom. He was delivered safe and sound. Yeah, here's George. George is sound sleep. It's awesome. Welcome to the world, baby George. You have incredible parents, Edmund and Emmanuel. And uh, Edmund posted on social media, thank you for bring on behalf of you, George, thank you for bringing me safely into this world. I hope I can pay you back someday. That is a national for Thursday, August the 6th.